I'm told the universe has a way of balancing itself out, and since my last video and my last reading was so positive, I guess it was inevitable I had to come, uh, read some stuff that I wasn't as happy about. Uh, not unhappy about it. I'm glad I read it. It's stuff that uh, I was definitely curious enough about to finish, but um, not necessarily stuff I'd recommend. I was going to actually add one more story onto the list of things I was going to talk about today, but I thought, well, that'll just get buried because I, I like that story. So the next thing will be positive that I do after this. Anyway, for uh, this is continuing with things I'm reading, horror-related stuff I'm reading, most of it older in the public domain, most of it on the short side, uh, in, in the spirit of the Horror Mayhem original uh, original brief of, of, the, of, the, uh, <clears throat> of the event when it was started was to read shorter horror, and um, that works for me. Some of the stuff I'll be reading later in the month is longer, but so far I've read two novellas by... Angstrom to short one novella and one uh, long story by Robert Louis Stevenson. Uh, today is probably the longest thing I've read so far is The Beetle by Richard Marsh. Not long, it's longer, but and I'm also I also read that for Rogers Cheapo Book Club. I'll link to Michael K. Vaughn's review of it. I didn't enjoy it that much. It's it's a mess, frankly. It's a mess. It was. Uh, there's better reviews of it. Michael K. Vaughn's talked about it twice on his channel. There's really nothing that I can say that he hasn't covered. I think he probably liked it a little more than I did, but um, I found it readable in that I wanted to keep reading to see what would happen. Uh, and when I say it's a mess, it's just kind of is like stylistically all over the place. And I was curious, reading it made me curious enough about it that I had to at least do some online research about it because I was curious about why this book was so popular at the time, which I don't know, and why it's been kind of revived critically. And I thought that stuff was probably more interesting. Apparently, this is a, a book that nowadays people like to write papers about or like to, to add in, into their papers and their discussions about colonialism and literature and uh, queer theory and different theories that different academics have. It seems uh, more, and it's the kind of book that's uh, good for that kind of thing because it's not so much, I sometimes think if a book has a lot of flaws and it is uh, confusing and, and uh, a mess and really, uh, uh, leaves critics and social analysts and historians a lot to talk about sometimes. Um, sometimes I like black coffee, sometimes I like coffee with milk, and sometimes, like a, a day today apparently, I just like uh, milk with a tiny bit of coffee in it. I don't know why. I've been drinking tons of milk lately. Um, so... It's uh, briefly, it's it's a, about a character called the Beetle, who's a like arch villain type guy. He's a swarthy uh, cult Egyptian from outside of Europe, someplace, and he's taking revenge. He wants to take revenge. He's got mind control powers. Almost, he he wants to take revenge on a member of Parliament who did him wrong, who destroyed his cult, the cult of ISIS that he's part of, and other people are part of. He reminded me very much of a pulp hero. I mean, I guess this is a pulpy novel. It's really not from the pulp tradition, like the American pulps or anything. It reminded me very much of like somebody Doc Savage or the Spider would face, or you know, old movie serials. Is that kind of level of uh, over the top villain? Um, but I think it's done better other, other places. Then there's kind of relationship stuff and things going on and. Politics. That sometimes it seems it wants to be more like a spy novel or something. So I don't know. That's probably enough about that. I'm. Uh, I would not recommend reading it. I would say don't bother. The next thing I want to talk about is a group of stories written by one of my favorite writers of all time, and I didn't like any of these stories. 
a couple uh, were interested in reading. Uh, I'm going to pause so I can look up the stuff here. Tales of Men and Ghosts by Edith Wharton, yet another public domain book. Edith Wharton is one of the great American novelists, one of my favorite American novelists. Read a lot of her books this year. I'd highly recommend reading The Custom of the Country. It's the one that always stands out for me. There's a great short... The first thing I read by her was years and years ago um, called Bunner Sisters, B-U-N-N-E-R Sisters, which apparently was not a popular book when it, was, when it came out. It's a short novel later in her career. And it's great. I used to have this book, I think it was by Signet or one of those kind of classic things. I think it was called Eight, Eight Great American Short Novels or something like that. It had, you know, it had stuff like The Ballad of the Sad Cafe in it. It had, uh, what's that Faulkner one about the, the horse trainer? I, I, doesn't matter. Um, I don't need to remind me in the comments because I'll probably look it up. Or you can remind me if you think, if it rings a bell. Anyway, Bunner Sisters was in that, which is a very social, realistic, uh, short novel, 100 pages or so, 80 pages, about these two sisters who run this, as far as I can remember, it's like a notions shop or a ribbon shop or maybe an underwear shop, something like that, some kind of shop that sells lady stuff and their, and their uh, problems uh, trying to trying to make it work. They're middle-aged sisters. They don't have any family. I mean, they don't have any uh, spouses or children or anything like that. And the ending of that story is so brilliantly heartbreaking, so amazingly moving. It, um, and I think her, her biggest... Uh, Um, probably her, her most famous uh, book, well, it's hard to say, but Ethan Frome is one of her famous books. Uh, there was the one that was made into a Scorsese movie, uh, The Age of Innocence, one of her major books. I, I like all that stuff. Ethan, Ethan Frome was probably not the one I would start with uh, because it seems a little out of character for her. I think her best books are about, you know, f uh, for lack of a better terms high society they're they're kind of like henry james she's better than henry james in my opinion because she's a, a bit more edgy i think she started writing a little bit later but they were friends um her characterizations are extremely sharp and her social commentary is extremely sharp and her stories are endlessly compelling all of which i'm saying don't start with Tales of Men and Ghosts. If you want to read Edith, Edith Wharton, I don't think you would start with this, but it's very disappointing. And I was curious enough to see... It was written in 1910, which is like 10 years into her writing career. She's probably already famous at this point. So I, I would read these. I would think these are really something that like she had done before she figured out how to write. Or that's probably not fair. Or late in her career after, you know, not her specifically, but late in the career of someone who's uh, no longer being edited and just everything that they've written is being published. So I researched this too and found out that definitely got mixed reviews when it came out. Um, it's not good. Stuff is not good. Uh, I have some theories about it though. These stories are sort of mixed between ghost stories and and she has some other ghost stories that aren't in here too, so maybe those are better. But and sort of mystery stories. These are like kind of more commercial stories, and I'm wondering if my my unsubstantiated theory of this is that she tried to do this kind of writing as well as her other kind of writing, and then she gave up and just said, "I'm just going to be a." a literary novelist of character. I don't really know how to do these kind of silly plots and stuff because these stories, and the reason I mentioned the, the Bunner Sisters earlier is that fantastic ending. These these stories, the ones that, that are even readable, that have like almost no ending. This one, some, this one of these stories, uh, The Debt, which I'd say the best, the most two readable stories in here are The Bolted Door, 
and the debt. And those are both stories that happen to be about writers, male writers in this case, um, but in both cases, but... And they're really fun to read. That's why I kept reading the whole anthology to see if there's something else like this in them. They're really well written because the characterization, the setups are so good. And for example, in The Debt, this is not active table of contents. Oh, geez, what lame stuff. You know, you get what you pay for with the free books, folks, uh, so it's not an active... Oh, there we go. The Debt. Wait, is this what it's... Am I in the right story? Ay, ay, ay. Maybe that's not the one. I don't think that's the right story. <laughs> Okay, that's not the one I want to talk about. Never mind. Back up. Cut this part. This is uh, strike this in the record. Full circle. Which is about as dumb a title for it as the debt would have been. But anyway, Gregory Benton. He's a writer. He's written a book that's a big success. And he's a piece of shit. He's a very obnoxious kind of person. He's sort of the the cliche of a famous writer. His fame has gone to his head. And actually, he seems to even have been a a jerk uh, before he was famous, because he he screws over this friend of his who's a writer. Doesn't screw him over intentionally. Doesn't screw him over because he's jealous. And screws him over because he can't really be bothered to think about anybody but himself. You know, he, he has this book come out and his friend has written a book uh, as well and his friend has had his book rejected but he thinks his friend's book is pretty good so he says, leave the manuscript here, I'm going to show it to my agent or my editor or whatever. Never, just doesn't get around to it. Just never gets around to it. You know, if something happens, he forgets, he gets invited to lunch or something. Uh, you know, eventually the, the friend comes and asks for the book back the manuscript back, which apparently it's taken back and, you know, his maid or something gives it back to the guy. He doesn't even really see the guy. This is after like months of not fulfilling the very simple promise of just helping his buddy out. So I think he loses track of that guy. When this book starts, he's really upset because his second book is coming out and he knows he's going to get a bunch of fan letters and he hates fan letters and he hates his fans and he hates having to respond to these fan letters and he thinks all the people who read his books are stupid. He's an awful guy. So he hires a um, person to write his, his answers mail for him and it turns out to be this, this guy. You know, he gets this, this friend that he, he screwed over in the past writes back and, um, you know, applies for the job, and it's just like a couple hours a day. He's like, well, you, do you really want to do this? That's a bad message. He's like, I really need money. So he starts answering the mail, and the mail dries up really quickly because his, his new book is not as good. Um, he, he doesn't want to read the mail, and suddenly he wants to read the mail because he wants to know why, why he doesn't have as many fans as he used to, and then he doesn't want to read the mail again, and then he's... Uh, a, lot, a lot of messes going on with the mail and the um, the person who's his secretary now who the the writer seems to think is maybe harbors some secret resentment of him and uh, so it goes back and forth about these letters and what to do about them and people are writing fake letters and people are I think I have to sneeze I did have to sneeze so I spared you that anyway so there's fake letters and there's accusations of fake letters and there's a lot of paranoia and it builds and builds and builds and builds to nothing. I won't spoil the, I don't know why anybody would want to read this story after what I've said, but um, the, the sort of the kicker, the sort it literally trails off in the last sentence, um, is supposed to be some kind of revelation that really is like, you know, there's really nothing behind it. Uh, the, there's, there's no great scheme on the plan of the uh, secretary to take revenge. Uh, there's nothing. He's like, I just wanted, I just needed the money for the job. And it's like, yeah, we know. The ten, ten, 
10 pages ago, we already covered that part of the plot. Why are you repeating it? So that was a terribly disappointing story. And the first story is probably the best. The first story in the book is uh, that one I, the bolted, uh, it, it's another one with a pretty great, pretty great setup. This guy, Hubert Grannis, is another kind of horrible person. He is, who's a writer, he's a rich guy who's been trying to break into playwriting for 10 years. 10 plays over 10 years, something like that. Spent, there's a lot of 10s in this. Uh, he spent like $10,000 to to mount one of his plays once, lost all the money. Pretty well convinced that, that the problem is the audience. The audiences are, really just don't come up to his standards. He, as this story opens, he's written a verse play which would be out of fashion at this time. And he gets a response from the, from the producer that he's been working with who says, you know, I think the time really is right for a verse play, but the, not this one. And, you know, there's, there's a funny rejection. It's probably the most cutting uh, rejection letter you could ever see. It's like, dear Mr. Granis, I've given the matter my best consideration for the last month and it's no use. The play won't do. I have talked it over with Miss Melrose. Uh, she's the, uh, and you know, there isn't a gamer artist on her stage, so she's the person who would be in it. And I forget to tell you, she just, she feels just as I do about it. It isn't the poetry that scares her or me either. We both want to do all we can to help along the poetic drama. We believe the public's ready for it, and we're willing to take a big financial risk in order to be the first to give them what they want, but we don't believe they would be made to want this. The fact is there isn't enough drama in your play to the allowance of poetry. The thing drags all through. You've got a big idea, but it's not out of swaddling clothes. And then it even gets worse. If this was your first play, I'd say try again. But it has been just the same with all the others you've shown me. And you and you remember the result of the Lee Shore where you carried all the expenses of production yourself. And we couldn't fill the theater for a week. Yet the Lee Shore was a modern problem play. Much easier to swing than blank verse it isn't as if you hadn't tried all kinds etc etc we see him read this letter which he's got not insignificantly uh, uh, underneath his loaded revolver and he's pretty much convinced he's going to kill himself he's been trying he's like there's no reason for me to live I was trying to write these commercial plays it didn't work so I tried to write just true a piece of art and you know and I still suck and then he finds he doesn't have the courage to kill himself so he's got another plan which in in the in the sort of context of a crime story a sensation story or that of the other isn't that bad a plan where he decides like well I did murder my uncle uh a few years ago, and that's how I became rich. Not my uncle, my cousin, my older cousin. I murdered him, and I'm... So what I'll do now is I will just confess to the murder. I'll get my friend the lawyer over here, and I'll confess to the murder, and then I'll be executed, and that way I will not have to live, and I will not face the courage of not being able to kill myself. So he brings his friend over, tells him how he murdered his, his cousin. Friend doesn't believe him. He's like, oh, come on. He's like, Boy, you can tell you're a playwright because this is a real wild story you made up here about this. And the friend leaves and doesn't believe me. He's really upset. Now you sort of might be getting the clue that, oh, I see what's going to happen. No one's going to believe him. So he's going to write it as a play. And the play's going to be a big hit. And then he's going to get exposed. No, nope, you're wrong. That's not what happens. Uh, basically, nothing happens. He, After he, his friend, the lawyer, doesn't uh, believe him, he decides to go to uh, visit his other friend, the lawyer, who doesn't believe him, who's a prosecutor. And he def- Defides, decides to visit his friend, the investigative journalist who doesn't believe him. Nobody believes that he really killed his cousin, which is an interesting premise because, you know, here he's got, he actually blamed, he, 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 he blamed, he did a racist, uh, uh, 
his father, his, his, or his cousin, I think, said something racist about Italians once about, like, you can never trust Italians, they'll always rob you or something. And that gave him the idea to blame an Italian, not a specific Italian, just blame the idea. And everybody went along with that. So that's kind of a good or a believable social um, motivation, so, social mores kind of comment on the time that this guy, no one believes this guy killed his uncle just because he's he's upper class and he's nice and he's uh, rich and he's refined. and I mean, I keep saying his uncle, but it was his cousin. Uh, so no one believes him. And then eventually uh, someone agrees to, said, okay, well, I'll, I'll put an investigator on the case and he can investigate it, the detective, and if he could prove he can do it, then, then maybe we'll consider reopening the case and, and putting you on trial, executing you for this murder, which no one is interested in reopening. Um, then they do that, but then he finds out that they didn't actually send a investigator. They sent a psychiatrist that, to pose as an investigator and an alienist. So that's a, another word for a psychiatrist, I think. Um, I'm pretty sure. Uh, <laughs> and they, they basically decide, okay, you're just you're going to the insane how uh, insane how asylum because because we can't get you off of this thing. And he decides, well, yeah, I probably am insane, even though he never, you know, there's no, there's no hint from him, at least. It's mostly in his point of view. There's no hint from him that he's making this up. You know, he really did kill his, his uncle, and he is a, a true sociopath, because he never in any of this does he ever think uh, he did anything wrong. You know, it's mentioned by a couple people that, you know, so why are you, uh, why are you saying this? You want to unburden your conscience? He's like, no, I told you I want to die because I can't get my place produced. I have, and then he thinks, oh, oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah, no, my conscience is bothering me. Yeah, that's that's why I, I admitted to it. So please put me in jail and execute me because my conscience is bothering me. But he has no conscience. He's just a piece of shit. And. <clears throat> So he goes to the mental institution, and then he kind of drops out of the story, and a couple of their co uh, characters are talking to the end and said, boy, it's really weird that, you know, he believed, you know, he never stopped believing he killed his cousin. And then the, the character, I think it was the investigative journalist at the end, goes, oh, yeah, he, he killed his cousin. Like, what do you mean? He's like, oh, well, in, in the course of the investigation after a few years, I figured out, yeah, I probably did do it, but, you know, what's the point at this time of bringing it all up and everything? And that's the end of the story. It's the, it really just peters out again. The, the, this guy tries to convince everybody that he killed his cousin. He can't convince them. And then you find out later that one of the people that he tried to convince eventually on his own comes to the conclusion, but he's not even that perturbed by it or anything, so... Yeah, you know, those two stories just have such flat endings. The others are more ghost, and neither of those are supernatural stories. The others are more ghost related. But I just don't think it's her kind of story. I maybe at some point I'll try and read some of her other ghost stories. I have them in another collection. But I just they don't seem to like the work of the same writer. But the stuff that's interesting in the stories that I read is the kind of stuff that is so good as part of her novels. So I think it's just a, t a type of writing that she didn't really excel at, like quote-unquote genre writing. And, and she found her way in doing different things. She wrote masterpieces. So it's, you know, it's a reminder that like very few people write only masterpieces. It's kind of a thing you, uh, we have now access to because... It, you know, everything's in print from the old days. A lot of stuff's in print just because of a person's name. You can see their good stuff, their bad stuff. Same with movies. You know, it used to be every classic, old classic movie seemed to be pretty good because sort of the mediocre ones, there was just no way to see them anymore because people didn't keep bringing them out, re-releasing them and things like that. And you realize that every era has its good stuff and its bad stuff. Except uh, 2024, which doesn't seem to have that much good stuff. Anyway, then there was uh, some stories I read in, um, I got a, a couple of their collections, uh, just a ton of old stuff in 
in here that I'll go over next time that's pretty cool. I found out that I have actually three. I have this uh, Tales of Men and Ghosts Edith Wharton thing in three different versions. I have that standalone one I showed you. I have a massive Delphi Edith Wharton collection, which has got tons of great stuff in it. Some of those, I didn't mention it before, but you know, some of those giant, giant freebie or $1.99 collections on Amazon of like the complete Dickens or, or the complete uh, Samuel Johnson or just, just that have a massive amount of stuff. They can be pretty hard to navigate. So sometimes when I'll find something I want to read, if I want to read a specific book, if it's Dickens or whoever, I'll, I'll download a, a standalone free copy anyway. Although it's nice to have all that stuff. Anyway, uh, next time I will talk about something better.